1 Kings 21. We begin in chapter 16 looking at this fellow by the name of Ahab, the king of Israel, the son of an evil man by the name of Omri. Omri was the king of Israel also. He was Ahab's father. But then it says of Ahab, he was more evil than everybody before him. So he set a new bar for being wicked and evil. And if that wasn't enough, the scripture says, <laughs> he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, a Sidonian king. She was a Sidonian princess. And as we've seen throughout our study, she has been a very wicked woman. And again tonight, we're going to get a chance to take a little bit of a look at this woman Jezebel and what the scripture records about her. Ahab introduced Baal worship into Israel. Before that, Jeroboam had brought in the golden calves and did pretty much what Aaron did when Aaron said, here's the gods that brought you out of Egypt. And so Jeroboam, when the kingdom was divided, set up the golden calves and said the same thing. This is what Jehovah looks like. The difference with Ahab is he switched to a new god, a god of the pagans, Baal, completely. And so that's his testimony in the scriptures. That's what recorded of him. He is a wicked man. This Ahab is seen a lot so far. He has seen a prophet sent by God who would declare a drought, a drought that would lead to a famine. He would see the challenge of the gods up on Mount Carmel where he would witness fire coming out of heaven and the God that he opposed burn up the sacrifice, the wood, the rock, the water, the dirt. Just pretty much seems like left a hole in the ground once he answered the prayer of Elijah. And we saw last week on two occasions, a prophet came to him and said, Ben-Hadad is going to give you trouble, but God is going to deliver him into your hand. And we saw tremendous mercy for Ahab by the Lord, so undeserved grace for him. And then when he defeated him, he said, but don't get too comfortable. He's coming back in the spring. And when he came back in the spring, they were like two little flocks of goats, and the Syrians filled the valley. And again, God brought about a great and a wonderful miracle. So Ahab, as wicked as he is, has seen God do some incredible things and been showing him his power and his mercy and has spared him thus far. But he's still a man against God. He is still a man that won't turn his heart against the Lord. Maybe you know somebody in your life that God has been good, he's been merciful, he's been gracious to them. Maybe that was you for a season until finally you came to the realization, I need to get my life in tune with the Lord. And there are people out there that God has just been, been merciful to them, and they're just against God. They just do not turn no matter what God seems to do. So we get to chapter 21 again, and this time again, we're going to be looking at Jezebel's influence on Ahab, and we've talked about that. This will be the culmination of that in the scriptures, and it's maybe the biggest influence in his life. It's, it's the, the most fullest recorded event we find earlier that it said that really the biggest mistake in the life of Ahab is that he married Jezebel. And when you read the biblical biography, you would concur with all that she did in his life and how she influenced this man, how she controlled this man, and how she stirred him up, as the scripture said. He listened to her. It, it, it was his downfall. It was his, his, his tragedy. Again, in this chapter, she will be a man of God killer. Again, in this chapter, we're going to see Elijah confronting Ahab. And the only difference this time is Ahab is going to respond in a different manner. If you don't know the biblical account, he'll surprise you. It's the only time that he does something that's good in his life. It, when it's recorded, it's like, okay, well, maybe this is a turn of events for Ahab until you get to chapter 22. Then he falls right back into old patterns, unfortunately. So chapter 
21, verses 1 through 4. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near, next to my house. And for it, I'll give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I'll give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went to his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed, turned away his face, and he would eat no food. So we are introduced to Naboth. The Jezreelite, he lived in Jezreel. You, if you live in Dayton, are Daytonites. If you live in Silver Springs, you're Silver Springians. You know, if you live in Carson City, you're Carson Cityans. You know, that's what we would say, you know. Tom, the Carson Cityan. Why? Because he, he lives in Carson City, and the rest of us are Daytonians and Silver Springians and Stagecoachians and all those kinds of things. That's why he's called a Jezreelite. That's the city that he's from. I want you to note here that it says about Ahab, he is the king of Samaria. So you Bible students want to catch little things like that because we found in chapter 20, twice, in two verses, verse 40 and 43, he's called the king of Israel because that's where he belonged. But now because of the transition of power, it's been moved up into Samaria his father Omri built Samaria, the city, for himself, and he began to rule from there. But now the whole region is known as Samaria, and he is here called now the king of Samaria. And so really it's indicative of his drift away from the true God. This will be called Samaria all the way into the time of Jesus. If you remember in John 4, Jesus met the woman of Samaria at the well of Sychar and conversed with her. In Luke's gospel, Jesus went into a Samaritan community. They would not receive him. And James and John said, Lord, should we call down fire out of heaven like Elijah? The Lord said, you guys don't know what spirit you're of, man. So Samaria remained, it, it became a region, an area. It's south of the Galilee today, uh, north of, of Jerusalem and all that. It's, it's still kind of, you know, people don't really call it Samaria anymore, but it remained Samaria for a long time. So here he's called the king of Samaria. Ahab makes him an offer or a trade for the vineyard. He wants to put a vegetable garden next to his palace. Kind of interesting, I think. He's a green thumber. Ahab wants a veggie garden. I would think a man of that stature lets other people take care of those things. But apparently he liked to mess with the soil. How many of you guys like to have vegetable gardens? My hand's up with you. I love them. That's my place of relaxation. Man, I just love to get out there and play in the dirt and grow stuff and then enjoy it. I love what I learn from gardening from the Lord. Because Jesus often used agricultural parables to illustrate truths to us. When I started my garden, the house we bought, they have a greenhouse there, 12 by 14. I mean, it's an incredible greenhouse. It's got a glass front door. Oh, it's, 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 it's a beautiful greenhouse. But the soil stinks. Apparently what they did is when they built our subdivision, they trucked in a bunch of soil and they leveled the place out. And they brought in some junk desert soil. So I have to amend the soil because the soil has nothing in it. But I love that because it's an illustration of my heart. Remember the parable of the soils in, John, in Matthew 13, where Jesus said the seed is sown in the soil? And all of our heart is like soil. When we get saved, it's junk soil. It's got nothing in it. There's, there's nothing. It's it's. it's sandy, dirt, nothing, 
And the Lord is amending my heart. As I walk with the Lord, as you walk with the Lord, it's a constant amending of my heart, making the soil of my heart a place where he can sow the seed of his word. It'll grow healthily, and it'll bear fruit 30, 60, 100-fold. So every year, I, I mean, I'll dig it up to a foot deep. I did that last year, finished it off. I put goat poop. I put horse poop. I put leaves in there, everything that comes off the table, whether it's a coffee ground, whether it's an eggshell, whether it's the clippings from the salad, everything that came out of my garden, it all goes back in the soil so I could put good organic matter and feed the crop the next year. Now I go through my soil, and it's better. Before you went to stick a shovel in it, it went in three inches. Now you could slam a shovel in it, it'll go eight, nine inches on the first cast. You know, it's, it's just got organic matter. Last year was such a difference. So I love that. I love to watch stuff come out. I love to watch the tomatoes coming out and the first melons and watermelons when you see them because you just see the hand of God in creation. Do you realize, guys, and a lot of us don't think about this, every seed has to do what? It has to die, right? Did Jesus not say that a seed falls to the earth and it dies? And unless it dies, there's no life. Do you realize the seed has to dry out and die, and inside that seed, there is no life whatsoever? But you stick it in the ground, you throw some water, you get it at the right depth and the right temperature, and it germinates. Every seed that grows, whether it's a fruit, a vegetable, or a weed, is the act of God in resurrection. I was up on Masada in Israel. We were going through Herod's warehouses, and the tour guide was describing what was going on. He got to Herod's warehouses and said they recently did some excavation in there, and they found some date seeds. These date seeds are 2,000 years old. They collected them. An agronomist came along and got a few of them. Guess what? Several of them germinated when they were planted. You tell me that seed was alive? No, 2,000 years dead, dry in the Israeli desert. But they put it in, and life came. Guys, every seed that sprouts is God just saying, I have the power of the life, and that's resurrection from the dead. It, it, it's there, so don't, don't miss that. Don't miss, you know, the world out there could say it's evolution. How can they answer a dead seed? I don't care water, what you put on the thing, it's dead. But God gives it life. So I love gardening. Why did Ahab like gardening? I don't know. Maybe he just liked to get out there messing the dirt. And maybe, it, you know, it clears my mind. That's my therapy, I tell people. That and hunting. I get out in creation, and, and I'm just out there. It's therapy for me. Love it. Maybe Ahab needed it. He wanted to have a garden. So he's offering this deal to Naboth. Seems like a good, fair deal, Right? hey, I'll, I'll trade you a better vineyard than what you got. And if you don't want to trade, hey, what's the market value? Name your price. I'll pay the deal for you. But the response of Naboth is interesting. He says, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Naboth, I believe, is one of the several thousand that had not bowed his knee to Baal. Because what he is doing is he is standing on the law of God. In Leviticus 25, it talks about where God says, first of all, all this land belongs to me. The land of Israel does not belong to the nation of Israel. It belongs to Jehovah God. He said the land belongs to me. So the UN and the US and everybody else who wants to divvy parts and pieces and trade off and do two-state solutions, God says the property is not up for sale. It's my property. And he let the people of the land know that too. And the way he designed the 12 tribes and the boundaries and the territories is he said, if something goes wrong and you've got to kind of sell the land to somebody to pay a debt, on the year of Jubilee, every 49th year, everything reverts back to the original title deed owner. God kept them from monopolizing the land. No one tribe could get bigger and bigger and bigger, and no one tribe can get smaller and smaller. God had put in a plan whereby it would all revert back to the original families and the original tribes. 
And that was your inheritance. That's what your dad left to you. It wasn't like, all right, my dad left me a 600-acre ranch, man. Things worth about three million bucks. I'm going to sell it off and go buy me a a little, you know, $500,000 beach resort over there. You couldn't do that. It it was part of the family. You kept it in the family. And unless hard times came, then, then, you know, you would have to do it. Ezekiel says that the princes were not allowed to take the land from the people. I like that. No imminent domain by the government. Just because you're a ruler, you couldn't enact a law or use your power of the throne to take the land of the people. It's their land. Leave their land to them. Numbers tells us the inheritance shall not change. It also tells us in Deuteronomy 19 and 27, and again, it's reiterated in the book of Proverbs, at least two places, you are not to move the landmarks of the people. Your property would have a landmark like you do today. You know, you, you got that marker there where, where the surveyor comes out and he shoots it and he, he'll find a pin right down there sometimes buried in the ground. That's your landmark. So you, you couldn't say, well, you know what? I, you, I'm going to make your property smaller. You owe me 50 bucks and you moved them. The law said you don't touch landmarks. It belongs to the people. So that's what Naboth is basically doing. He said, I I can't sell it to you. I can't trade it. This is the inheritance from my fathers for generation through generations. And he's going to pass it on to his sons when his time comes to go. So that's why I believe he's one of the guys who didn't bow his knee to Baal. And Nahab, being a mature kind of guy, is okay with it. Rather, he's again sullen and displeased. We saw that in 2043, didn't we? When he didn't kill Ben-Hadad and the prop that came to him and said, you made a big mistake, buddy. You should have took this guy out. Now you're going to lose it. And he went home sullen and displeased. Basically, it means he was bummed out and very unhappy with the news. You know, he just copped an attitude and, and, and was just, man, I, I don't like what's going on. Not the behavior of a king, let alone the behavior of an adult man. You know, where he's pouting. He goes home. He gets in bed. He turns his head to the wall. Dinner time, I'm not hungry. You could see your eight-year-old doing something like that. We've got a grown man who is supposed to be a king, and, and it's just part of the character of Ahab that we see here. It's not the character of the man of God that he's trying to build in us. We're taught that spiritually, the walk of the Spirit, we move through a lot of things in life that normally other people are bummed out and displeased about. We're taught the type of attitude that as men of God, we ought to have. That we still have to have that maturity in the Lord and that spiritual strength of the Spirit. When we go through very difficult stuff, we just don't get in, we don't fall apart, and we certainly don't go to our room and whine. We see Ahab was a lover of himself, and he's not a lover of the law of God. We see in his life that the principles of God's law had no place in his life. We today are no longer under the law. Jesus was born of a woman under the law. He fulfilled every dot and every cross of the T of the law for us. So if somebody ever asked you, have you fulfilled the law? You can say, yes, I have. In Christ Jesus, I have fulfilled the law, the covenant of the law. Because the Lord has done that for you on behalf of you. However, always remember that in the law, there are many important principles that we still live by today. You know, in the law, it said, and we'll see this in a moment, You take no accusation against somebody except in the presence of two or three witnesses. And in our jurisprudence system, we still follow that today. That it's still part of our law. Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Equal retribution, equal compensation. We still practice that in our jurisprudence system. Now we've got punitive damage and all kinds of other bizarre things, and they they get carried away with stuff like that. But, you know, if you destroyed something, you've got to recompense that person for what you destroyed. In the Old Testament, if you cursed your mom or your dad, if you struck your mom or your dad, the law said, you stoned that boy. 
God is teaching he doesn't put up with juvenile delinquency and disobedience. It's the fifth commandment. You honor your mom and your dad. The New Testament, it's the first command with a promise because length of days and long life you'll get. You don't do that, and you may get stoned early on. So God, the principle is God doesn't put up with juvenile delinquency and disobedience, whereas our culture today gives preference to the youth to dishonor their parents. They'll even do things today where they won't notify parents in the school, but they will take the girl out and she can have an abortion. They can actually take the kid out and they can have sex changes and things like that. So our, our culture is not seeing the principles that God put throughout the Old Testament law. They, they were good for a nation and they're still good. We don't abide in them for righteousness or anything like that, but always remember as you go through the Old Testament, I do, and I see a law that God instills, I always stop and think, how does that apply to a nation and a group of people today? Is that wisdom still there? Is there a principle that God still is seeking? And you'll find there is. There is. God will, will always have a, a beautiful principle. The Sabbath, a day of rest. I mean, now we get usually two days off, right? You know, 40 hours is a work week. You got it even better for the most part. But God said you got to at least give people one day off. And that's the law in my land. That's a good thing. That's a good thing to have a day of rest, and, and, and then you've got six more days to get back at it. And certainly they often work from sunrise to sunset. So our labor laws today have really made it a lot better for the working man, even though it sometimes may not feel like it to you. But in those days, God had principles in there because he was accomplishing certain things. You get into the, the Levitical dietary laws. There were things that God prohibited them to eat. And one of the reasons in there is because they weren't good for you. Pork. You know, anybody ever got trichinosis from pork? Ever, ever got food po Anybody got food poisoning from pork? I have. And I'll tell you what, man. It tears your gut up and you're sick. I couldn't eat pork chops for like two years, man. But now they, they process the feed that they give to the animals. They don't have to worry about that bacteria being in the pork unless you're growing your own pig on your own ranch. And you got to think about those things. You know, so God is sometimes in those things looking out for his own people too. You know, so I find in the Old Testament law, there's a lot of wisdom there that God put in the law. And it had purpose and reason for, for people. But Ahab is not a man of the law. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, you could go and read it on your own, where Paul says that in the last days, men would be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, and not lovers of God, even though they had a form of godliness. Paul is not speaking about the world. The world doesn't have a form of godliness. He's talking about the church. And that's why perilous times are coming, because what should be the pillar and the ground of truth, he said, Part of what's called the church, people just love themselves and they act like they're Christians, but you know what? They really don't love God. They just love all the other things that are out there more than the Lord. And this is the picture of Ahab. Verse 7, in comes the missus. Then, then Jezebel, his wife's... Oh, wait a minute. How did I miss that? Oh, sorry. Good. Five. Thank you. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and I said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I'll not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Rise, eat food, let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of, Jez of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So the man who governs the kingdom is overcome by a vineyard. He's got all that, but he wants this, and he doesn't get this, and so now he's sad. And it's just not fair that he doesn't give it to me, trade it with me, let me buy it. And sullen and displeased, he's in his bed. And she has to remind him that he is the king, but her motive is wrong. She reminds him that you exercise authority over Israel. You're the king. She probably, as she's going to do things, he ought to just go in and take it. 
eminent domain. You're the boss. Exercise your power. But she can probably see the weakness in her own husband. And he's not going to do that. So she's going to take it into her hand. Notice she's going to devise a plan here very quickly. And what's interesting about this is Ahab didn't resort to taking Naboth's land by power and by murder. I mean, he's a bad, he's a wicked king, but he didn't come up with that plan. He's just pouting in the bedroom. But notice the wife, Jezebel. She said, I will give you the vineyard of Naboth. Naboth said, I will not give you the vineyard. Jezebel said, I will give you the vineyard. Notice what she does. Verse 8. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people, and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king, then take him out and stone him that he may die. She comes up with a quick plan to solve the vineyard crisis. This girl is pure evil. Notice how she does this. She's a dominant wife working behind her husband's position as a king, his position of power, knowing he can't control her, and because she works behind him, the people can't do anything about it. He's in charge. He exercises authority. Who's, any, who's going to tell him anything? And she knows that. So now she's going to do something, and nobody could tell her nothing because Ahab won't let them. But she controls Ahab. She's got him wrapped around her finger, so she's going to get what she wants. And this is that, that dominant, controlling wife. This is the one that, man, it's going to happen my way. So she uses his name, uses his official seal, and contacts his leadership to carry out her plan. And quickly she does it. Notice what the plan is. First of all, proclaim a fast. Usually a fast is proclaimed because there's a calamity, a crisis, a problem. And we need to seek the gods and so fast. We're going we're gonna to omit food, man. We're going to let our gods, and, and we fast to our Lord, and usually we omit food. We just say, Lord... I'm going to put away my natural human desire to eat. One of our strong drives, right? And and I'm not going to eat. And Lord, when I get hungry, I'm going to think on you and pray. I'm going to lift up to you the crisis, the problem, the struggle, the issue that, Lord, you might know that I'm serious about it. So this is why they might be suggesting it. Or it might just be, let's just have a fast to honor our God. Let's just tell our God, hey, we, we just think you're great and we're going to forego eating just to let you know we're serious about your greatness. So we, we don't know, she says, proclaim a fast, but we don't know the reason for the fast. Then she says, honor Naboth. Bring him in, give him an unusual respect. Put him in a super high position. A lot of visibility in the group. Seat him in a spot everybody's going to look up and go, Whoa, Naboth, he's somebody in the neighborhood. Wow, we, did, we didn't know that. Look at him. He's, he's visible to everybody right now. What, a, what an honor they've given him. Then she get, says, get some scoundrels. I like that. Two scoundrels, two men that are no morals, no ethic. They don't care. They'll probably get 50 pieces of silver. Go up there and you two guys lie, make up a story. Say that we heard him blaspheming God and we heard him blaspheming the king. In Leviticus, if you blaspheme God and somebody did, they put the guy in jail and they sought the Lord. The Lord said, if anybody blasphemes my name, they die by stoning. It's a capital crime. What a way to go, stoning. And so these guys here... You have them testify, you heard them. And here's a guy that was honored greatly, and he should turn around and blaspheme God and the king. How dare he? Everybody would just be insulted by that. And then take him out and kill him. Stone the guy. Get rid of him. That's Jezebel's plan in a heartbeat. So verse 11, 
So the men of his city, the elders and the nobles who were inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent to them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast, seated Naboth with high honor among the people, and two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him, and the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth is blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city, and they stoned him with stones so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned, and he is dead. All these elders, all these They're called noble, but there's nothing noble about these guys. They all know this is a lie. They all know it's a setup. They all know this is really wrong. This is immoral. But they carry out the plan anyways. It's very probable that these men already knew Naboth. They already, you know, local businessmen. He had a vineyard, interacted with the community. Cities in those days weren't enormous. So it's very probable that the elders and the nobles knew him, and they probably knew him as a very just and fair local. Probably liked the guy a lot. But they got this letter, and they're going to follow, they're going to follow Jezebel's plan to a T, man. They're, they just go step by step by step. Again, Deuteronomy 17, the law requires two witnesses. One person can't testify against the other person. It's just my word against your word. But if you can get a second and a third person in there, well, now now you got witnesses. And so we still use that in our jurisprudence system, but it comes out of the law of God. So as these two men are testifying against them, it seems like they quickly took Naboth out to stone him. And so they're complicit in this plan. They better act quickly. There's no chance to exonerate Naboth. There's no chance for him to put up a defense or or anything like that. This is a kangaroo court. You know, these guys said, you did it. You're guilty. Let's go take him out, stone him, hurry quick. And out behind the meeting hall, you know, there they all are with their stones, and, and Naboth is dead. Imagine Naboth's surprise that he would have a place of such high honor, wondering, what did I do to, to get to sit up here with the bigwigs today? And all of a sudden, these two guys start saying this thing, and Naboth's thinking, what are you talking about? I never did such a thing. And then the, the, you know, the captain of the guard snags him, and they drag him out, and he's thinking, what is happening here? One minute I'm being honored, and now they're going to kill me. And then quickly, death by stoning, and he dies. And they sent word back to Jezebel to let her know the work has been done. You got a weak, wicked king. You got a wicked, strong wife. And you got wicked, weak leadership. All complicit, actually, in this whole plan. All responsible in this whole plan. They're at Jezreel. And they work together and they kill a man who's a follower of the law of God. Instead of sending the letter back and saying, you know what? This is wrong, and we can't do this. We're not going to follow your plan. This is murder. This is lying. This is dishonest. These guys just cave in, and the probability is they're watching out for their own necks, too. They know that you buck the system, and you're going to end up getting stoned yourself. And that was the nature of the culture. We're men of truth, we're men of principle. We're men of God. Always in your life, stand on truth and principle no matter what it costs you. Personally, financially, relationally, whatever it is. You know, you've got to be a man of principle. You know, I I say win, lose, or die. I stand on principle. If I stand on principle and I win, good. If I stand on principle and I lose, good. If it's a draw, whatever. But I want to stand on principle, whether it makes me enemies, makes me friends, costs me money, costs me opportunity, costs me respect, whatever it is, men of God stand on principle. They stand on truth, and they don't give ground to nobody. They don't cave in. They don't get pressured by the culture. 
by the masses, by the majority, by the money, by any of those things. We just, we hold fast. And when you study the word of God, God makes us men of principle. He teaches us to, to hold to truth, to stand with a standard. And like Joshua said, you choose today who you're going to serve, whether the gods of Egypt, the gods on the other side of the river, or the God in whose land you dwell. But as for me in my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. Here's the line. Joshua drew a line, and he called out the people and the leaders of the land. He said, you pick the side of the line you want to stand on, but I stand on principle. I stand on the God of truth. I'm standing over here, and this line does not move based upon what the situation is. It always stays. So be a man of principle, brother. Win, lose, or draw. The outcome doesn't matter. It's whether or not we stand on the truths and the principles of God, the things that are always right, the things that are always true. And sometimes we've got to call people out when they're doing things that are not legitimate. And people don't like that. But you know what? Principle is principle. Truth is truth. And right is right. And so hold fast to that area. So again, Naboth, no doubt, surprised these men, cowards, they're, they're watching out for their own lives. It's a bad plan, but hey, we'll, we'll survive, you know. In 2 Kings 9.26, there's an inference also of the killing of Naboth and his sons. So when you read here that Naboth was killed, in reality, Naboth's sons also were killed because if only Naboth was killed, the law declared that his sons inherited the land automatically. And Jezebel wasn't going to have that. So she rounded up his sons also and killed Naboth's sons. Probably a little bit afterwards. Maybe they were there in the audience. We don't know. Maybe at one minute it was like, wow, look at daddy sitting up at the front with the bigwigs. How cool. Then they start dragging off dad and somebody says, that's his boys. Bring them too. And dad and sons all die together out in the back and are stoned together. So they, they let Jezebel, and, and I put there, that is Ahab. If they presumed that it was in his name, it has his seal came from him. They, they let him know, hey, we did the job. Or they really know who's behind it all. They, they've gotten word, yeah, it was Ahab's name. Yeah, it was his seal, but we recognize the handwriting. He don't write that nice. You know, his looks like a purple crayon, and hers is all sweet and pretty like gals. They usually, you know, print really well. Or whatever it is, they could probably say, you know, Ahab ain't got the guts to do anything like this. This is his old lady, man. She's a man killer. So I, either way, you know, they, here's the word comes back. Verse 15. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead that Ahab got up, went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. The plan has worked just like she hoped it would work. And so Jezebel puts another notch on her revolver. She's killed another innocent man or actually men because the sons were killed also. Ahab must think, wow, this, this girl takes care of business, man. She gets stuff done really quick. I'm the beneficiary of the land, so he's maybe impressed by his wife in what she does, and, and she gets rid of prophets and massacres them and scares Elijah out of the territory. He runs, and, you know, so he, maybe he thinks she's a pretty slick kind of gal. So he's going to take possession. He's got to go down. It's got to re be recorded, as they did all the time. The property transfer is recorded. So it would go down, and, and the local elders of the community, they would document this in their own more archaic, you know, take a piece of leather or something like that, and it would be written down that this land now belongs to King Ahab. It's, it's his land right next. And so 
He's already, you know, sending away to the seed catalog for, you know, tomatoes and watermelons and stuff like that. And he's got an order for some fertilizer to come in. He's going to buy himself a little tractor, you know, and he's, you know, the fruit trees are going to go back over here on this side. This is going to be a really nice place. Kind of excited about it. Till verse 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. We haven't seen Elijah till he anointed Elisha, as the Lord told him to. He still had to anoint Hazael as king of Syria. He still has to anoint Jehu as king of Israel. So he's, he's been out doing those kinds of things, but now the Lord speaks to him again and says, I got another job for you. You got to go back and see Ahab again. And God, from his perspective, says, there he is. I see him right there in Naboth's vineyard. We don't know where Elijah was, but I don't think Elijah, you know, you know, but, but that's the Lord's perspective. He sees everybody everywhere all the time. All things are naked and open before him in whom we have to do. That's kind of revealing, right? You're naked before God right now. I'm glad he sees all that. We don't have to look at all that. That'd be gross. But the idea, God says, is you hide nothing from me. You go nowhere. David said, Lord, if I ascend to heaven, lo, you're there. He goes, if I go to the depths of hell, you're there. If I go to the deepest part of the ocean, lo, you're there too. I can't hide anywhere from you. So in sin, sometimes we think we can keep it a secret and hide it from God. And you can't. I find that comforting. When I did wrong, I tried to hide it from my dad, and many times I got away from it, with it. And sometimes I got busted for it. Those were bummer times. Dad found out, now you're in trouble. I broke his cufflinks, and he never found out who broke his cufflinks. Because I hid the other good one after the other one got broke, you know? I think of a number of things I did. But my heavenly father, and I'd find comfort in that. Because you know what? It makes me face him right away. It would be nerve-wracking to think that you've hidden something from God and you're hoping that somebody who knows doesn't say something at church out loud and God will be at church and hear it. You know, you're hoping that somebody doesn't snitch on you to God for what you did in prayer. That would be nerve-wracking to me, just wondering if God's going to find out tomorrow. God knows in advance of what I'm going to do. Do you know how far in advance he knew? He knew before the foundations of the world because Jesus was preordained before the foundations of the world. And when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus died for every sin I will ever commit till I go to be with the Lord. They're already covered in advance by name and action already. So when I ask forgiveness for that sin, he pulls out a chart of accounts and I've got all these boxes checked off on forgiveness and then I got a whole list of unchecked boxes. He goes, that's all the stuff you haven't done yet, Gil, that I know you're going to do already, but I've made atonement for that already on the cross for you and for all of us. I find comfort in that. I find comfort in my father. If he says, I will chastise you because I love you, I find comfort in that because he loves me. My dad was a, was a spanking man. My dad was old school. He had a little pachuco belt he used to wear, and when I did wrong, he would tell me, he's a very young man, this is going to hurt me a lot more, it's going to hurt you, take your pants down, and he'd whip me on the butt and the back of the legs, he'd leave welts, he'd leave little lines of blood, and I have no resentment, I'm not psychologically impaired, my self-esteem is not messed up, I am thankful for my dad for the discipline he gave me, because I know he loved me. And the Bible says, despair not for the blueness of their wounds, and my dad didn't. It says, spare not the rod, and I'm glad my dad used a belt, not a rod on me. So our Heavenly Father is the same way. He does. He, he chastens us because he loves us, and we have to thank him. You can't hide nothing from him. And here's Ahab getting busted, and God is telling Elijah what is going on. 
Even though it was Jezebel who devised the plan, carried out the plan, I want you to know who's getting judged for what happened. God doesn't come to Jezebel and deal with Jezebel directly. She will be dealt with indirectly. God comes to Ahab the king because he is the head of the home. He is the husband. Like Adam, when they ate the fruit, God came to the garden. He didn't say, Eve, what have you done? He said, Adam, where are you? He will tell Eve, what have you done right afterwards? But first of all, he comes to the man because God has given the man the headship of the home and the chief responsibility. And it's no different in your household, gentlemen. It's no different. That's why we're to teach our wives and to wash them with the water of the word of God. That's why they're to submit to you as the head of the home. But we have the responsibility of raising them up and teaching them the word of God and praying with them that our prayers would not be hindered, Peter said. Husbands, love your wives that your prayers shall not be hindered. You give honor to that wife. God made her the weaker vessel. You're the stronger vessel. Gives you responsibility. Help her, build her, strengthen her, guide her, direct her. Be a leader. Don't be an Ahab. God is telling her, don't be a Jezebel. But God is telling you and me, don't be an Ahab. Because when we do it, God's not going to go to Jezebel. He's going to go to the Ahab in the home as he does right here. And so he finds Ahab responsible. Ahab's going to bring a word of final judgment for Ahab, revealing that when he dies, the dog is going to lick up his blood like the dogs licked up the blood when they stoned Naboth. Notice he continues on in verse 20. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you, I will take away your posterity and will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up, and he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel." Notice Ahab calls Elijah, now he calls him my enemy. Before he called him the troubler of Israel. Now you're my enemy. Man, you've been nothing but trouble for me, buddy, as he comes back. And he's told, you aren't going to have any kids. Your posterity is all going to die. You've provoked God. You've done evil. You've been abominable. You've made Israel sin. God's explaining it all. This is all the stuff that you've done, Ahab. This is going to be the consequence. And then he includes judgment on Jezebel, too. They're going to not going to lick her blood, we're going to find. They're actually going to eat her. And Second Kings, Jehu will come into Jezreel, and it says that Jezebel goes and puts her makeup on. She comes out to the window, you know, and calls him a, a traitor. And he says, who's with me? Who's with me? And a couple of eunuchs look out the window. They said, throw her out of the window. And they get her and they throw Jezebel out the window. Second, third story, I don't know. She hits the ground. Jehu goes over with his horse and he stomps her, kills her right there. And he goes home and has lunch. Then after lunch, he says, you know what? You ought to bury that gal. She was a queen's daughter. They go, they come back and they say, you ain't going to believe this. He goes, what's that? All we found was her feet, the palms of her hand, and her skull. The rest of her is gone. The dogs ate her. And he goes, that's the word of Elijah the Tishbite. And it says that her corpse will be spread across the ground like refuse. So when you walk by a dog poop and you look at it, oh, that looks like Jezebel. <laughs> that's what the Bible's saying. That's, that's why it says her corpse will be spread upon the ground like refuse. The dog just ate her. She got all purdied up to make her statement, and in the end, she looked like a pile of poop. Not a great ending, Jezebel. Not a great ending. But we'll get to that when we get 
into 2 Kings. And this will be the new king that Elijah is anointed again. It'll be Jehu. And like Eve, remember Eve, when God said, Eve, what have you done? No, the serpent deceived me. Said, okay, you're going to have kids. It's going to be painful. You ever watch an animal have babies? I watch a lion, the little thing just shoots out, kind of hits the curve of the tail. You watch a horse. I watched a cow one day drop a calf. I went, wow, that's amazing. But that old cow was going, ah, 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 you know, and I'm, girls are hurting. I'm not saying that girls, but it hurts. Women have been cursed because of what Eve did. When they bear, it hurts. Animals seem to just to drop them, lay them, hatch them. Do all those kinds of things, but you don't, you don't, you know, unless there's some sort of maybe a real medical complication. For the most part, animals don't go through the pain of childbirth like women do. And, and, and that's just what, what Eve picked up when she did what she did, unfortunately. Jezebel's going to get her judgment. All of them will be killed, and none of them will get a proper burial. It says, if they die in the city, the wild dogs of the city will eat them before they have a proper and honorable burial. If they die out in the field in the country, the birds will eat them, the carnivore birds, ravens, crows, magpies, camp robbers, you hunters, especially you elk hunters, you've seen it. I remember the first elk I killed. Killed it, we put it up in a tree, hiked back to camp, got up early in the morning to go fetch it. Mine was over there a ways, and another guy had killed one. It was about, oh, three quarters of a mile that way. So those three guys went to get that one. I had to go get mine. And I'm a guy. I got to go back and see the dead corpse, too, you know, when I go back. I just want to look again. And I was blown away at what the birds had done in less than 24 hours to the meat on the bones. It's like one of those wire wheels that you stick on a drill, and along the ribs, all you saw were these little pieces of just tendon they had eaten all the meat like you can imagine what they do to a human body that they'll just god says they're going to eat you up just like in the days of revelations the kings are going to be eaten by the birds ahab actually had his blood licked at samaria when he died in a chariot but his sons will be thrown in the field of naboth and there the dogs will lick the blood And the Bible says there was nobody like Ahab. A final commentary here, and we'll get him one more chapter. But there was nobody like him because nobody had a wife like him, Jezebel. She stirred him. She moved him. She incited him. She instigated him. He listened to her. Ahab was not a leader of men, but a follower of a woman. And she instigated him to false gods, false living, godless behavior. But something happens in the last two verses that is out of character for Ahab. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his body, and he fasted, and he lay in sackcloth, and he went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. For the first time, Ahab listens to the word of God. A lot of commentators will say this was not a legitimate repentance. Well, God acted on it. If God acted on it and God said it was, then I'm going to go with God on this one. It might not be long term, it might only be momentary, and God knows that. But God knows that he humbled himself, he tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth. He fasted. He went about mourning. Man, it was very obvious to everybody that Ahab really listened to the words. Unfortunately, chapter 22 will show that like people have done before, you know, they they listen to God and they act for a season and then they fall back and just become who they were before. But in this moment, he did that because the Lord said to uh, Elijah, look at how he's humbled himself before me. I'm going to postpone the judgment because of that. So what you learn in the Bible right here is not so much that this guy didn't stick to it. What I learn is God honors humility. God honors humility. And and when we humble ourselves, you know, Jesus said, learn of me for I'm meek and humble of heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. Learn of me. Jesus was a man of humility. The Bible says Moses was the most humble man on the earth at his time. And Moses at time was a fighter. Jesus was a fighter. But there's a humility that puts self down and puts self aside in order to, to do something for others. Humility recognizes what God has to say. It's one of the great attributes and characters and virtues of man. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Poor in spirit means you, you don't have that. Well, you know, now you ain't going to let nobody push me around, and I'm my own man, and I'm, I'm, I'm calling, you know. I, no, poor in spirit means, you know what? You're, you're a humble individual. You'll take the low place if you have to. Both James and Peter say God opposes the proud, but he gives great grace to the humble. So it is a great virtue. It is a great character trait of the man of God. David example that was Saul. Abishai said, let me strike him. I won't have to do it twice. He said, I'm not touching God's anointed. God will kill him or, or he'll die in the war or something will happen to him. But David was humble. He didn't say, well, you know what? I've been anointed as a king, and this guy's been giving me a bad life, and I didn't deserve none of this, and I'm tired of running from this dude, and I'm going to show him. He didn't do that. He took the place of humility. So God opposes the proud, but he gives great grace to the humble. 